exactly who you're facing in tonight's main yeah, event. Yeah, Any yeah, thoughts yeah. from both of you? We know half of the team, but not the full team. Uh, yeah. Well, we do know tonight, because I know a couple weeks ago, and I apologize to you guys, and I apologize to Rick, but Major props to Chris Lee filling in for me. You know, the fact is, truth be told, when you've got a career and a family, sometimes things just step in and you can't make it. But I'm here tonight to represent the dynasty, and I'm here tonight to be your tag team champion against Lee Bryant and whoever he picks. With that in mind, please welcome Lee Valiant! situation back on finals night 45 minutes in the tournament finals against Trevor Lee both of you an incredible effort from both of you and we felt that both of you deserve to be rewarded your reward a tag team title opportunity we all want to know who is going to be your partner tonight in the main event Tonight, my partner is somebody I got deep history with, somebody you got deep history with, and somebody you got deep history with. My partner is the Kamikaze Kid! Tonight at Wild Things, four former Mid-Atlantic champions, Kazi and Valiant, to face the dynasty. Alert C W F is live in five, four, three, two, one. I'm stuck here in the middle of nowhere, the darkness slithering the gravel to me. I'm the one dancing on the things that I don't know. Wait. CWF Mid-Atlantic is back live from Gibsonville, North Carolina's Mid-Atlantic Sportatorium. It is a beautiful night here as the summer turns into fall and Cecil Scott, we have got a huge eight-man tag team action opening things up tonight with a lot of bad feelings and personal animosity crisscrossing in this eight-man tag. You got that right, mate. The heat kind of dies down outside, but we got plenty of heat in the ring with these eight men, that's for sure. This is the first CWF Mid-Atlantic live event ever since the 2013 Weaver Cup Finals night three weeks ago here in the Mid-Atlantic Sportatorium. We're going to talk a lot about everything that transpired on Finals night. And among that, 
we saw Smith and Weston scoring maybe the upset of the year against the Killbillies. Prior to that match, there was only one team in a year and a half that had ever defeated the Killbillies in a two-on-two -two tag match, and now there are two. Smith and Weston scoring, like I said, Cecil, the upset of the year. Do you think the Killbillies might have took these guys too lightly? I think that's absolutely what happened. I mean, they went a year and a half, and the only team that beat them was the Goon Squad, and it doesn't get much better than that. Goon, so, Goon Squad, one of the most decorated tag teams in CWF Mid-Atlantic oh. history. So, yeah, I mean, it happens. I mean, when you're you're used to a winning way, you ca you're going to disregard a rookie tag team. Smith Garrett and Charlie Weston, two members of the Rising Generation League, CWF Mid-Atlantic's competitors with three years or less of professional experience tagging to Smith Garrett. Garrett is the less experienced of the two on his team and the least experienced man on his four-man team by far. Oops. Garrett still in his first year as a pro and uh, flexing for the camera, very full of confidence as always. He is, and I would say he might have the best physique here in CWF Mid-Atlantic, that's for sure. Very well put together. Certainly a toss-up between him and Matt Houston. <laughs> Collar and elbow tie up. Eric Andrews go behind. Eric Andrews, the wrestler of the Killbillies. Believe it or not. Several times he was a decorated amateur up in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Evan Banks, more of the more of the scuffler, as they say. Eric Andrews, the wrestler, tags into his father, Matt Houston. Matt Houston gets the arm, tags into Lewis Moore. The Mid-Atlantic Outlaws challenged for the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Championship back on finals night. It was a match that they had looked forward to for months, Cecil. And the Mecca Mercenary stormed the ring, ruined their title opportunity. And you were right here in the booth with me. You have, you've, you've taken on a little bit of a more passive role with Mecca recently. You definitely seemed like you had no firsthand knowledge of what he was doing either. And usually when me, when Mecca does something, it's something that we, we planned out plenty of time in advance, and I had nothing, nothing to do with that, let me tell you. And I think it's a case where he and I have both been after respect, after opportunities, and I guess he finally got tired of standing back and waiting. Yeah, this is not a new thing. This has been something that you guys have really been been preaching about and been uh, obsessed with for a long time now. And, you know, he, he's not a communicator. You know, even uh, it, it's very tough sometimes just to get this guy, you know, where he needs to be for, for an event, for a match, for whatever. He, he, he's a big monster. And you, we're not getting any answers out of him. And from the sounds of it, neither are you. Houston with a huge chop. You can see the pain on the oh. face of Smith Garrett. And I think Smith and uh, Weston came in here with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder after Weaver Cup finals night. And I think it's getting knocked right off by the Mid Atlantic Outlaws right now. Well, even though you're, oh, oh God. God, even though you're not an RGL competitor, even though you've been here for years now, wouldn't you have a chip on your shoulder after a huge victory like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been there before. You know, you get that one big win you've been waiting on, and yeah, you, you get a little cocky. Both of these young men, oh, God. both of these young men were winless in CWF Mid-Atlantic until the Weaver Cup Finals night three weeks ago. Woo, and Smith Garrett is just getting abused in that corner. There you go. And they've done the right thing and gotten the least experienced man in the match in that corner. You keep Mecca on the apron. You keep Michael McAllister on the apron. You keep Charlie Weston on the apron. You get that less, that least experienced guy who also is kind of a hothead. He's the most likely to make a mistake. You know, Smith and Weston, obviously. Oh, goodness. Great double team work there from the Outlaws and the Killbillies. Smith and Weston, obviously, you know, a, a good budding team because they got that big win. But they're still going to be prone to make mistakes. They're still rising generation league guys. Yeah, they're by no means unbeatable, man. I mean, there's still a lot of a lot of holes in that armor. But he got the eye rake. He gets McAllister in. McAllister, the most experienced man on the team, but someone who lately has been really going through a, a, a personal uh, sort of conflict. He's very uh, conflicted. McAllister, very intense, very vicious. Hooks Eric Andrews, perfect plex, cradles him. Good move, but only gets two. Oh, my God. Over the summer, we have seen the All-Stars disintegrate. We have not seen any of the All-Stars since June except for 
Michael McAllister, the lone man who stuck around and seems to have severed all ties with Coach Jim and I and the All-Star organization. He's a man without a country right now. Without a country and seems to be a man that's becoming a little bit unhinged. Two, only two. Unhinged is a great word for it. I've never seen him so vocal or so, honestly, so aggressive in a match. Great move to tag back in the big man, and everything slows down. Arrogant Eric Andrews, we used to call him. Now Southpaw, part of the Killbillies, slips in, and this is a matchup that the fans here in Gibsonville are on their feet to see the big Mecca mercenary against Eric Andrews, and look at him nose to nose. Yeah, people forget Eric Andrews is a big, tall guy. But of course, Mecca still has, I'd say, a good 100, 100 pounds on him. I got to say, not to take away from what's happening in the ring, but I don't know if I've ever seen Michael McAllister look better in all the years that he's been here in CWF Mid-Atlantic. Angry, vicious, but motivated and uh, illogical, you know? Absolutely, the right thing to do was to get the big man in right when he did it. Uh, really smart move. Uh, Mecca could be a game changer here in this big eight-man tag if he can just isolate one man and take Andrews down to the canvas like he has now. Well, I think he's already changed the game just by slowing down the pace of this. I agree, 100%. And not for nothing, McAllister is actually a guy I kind of lobbied to get in this eight-man tag with Mecca. You know, we spoke last time about finding some new tag team partners. I've teamed with McAllister many times in the past. And I feel like he's a trustworthy guy, and he's, he's going through an identity crisis right now. What that the? has been the speculation, a lot of the scuttlebutt. I don't know if you're spreading those rumors yourselves or if they're spreading independently of you, but a lot of the scuttlebutt in the locker room seems to be that Mecca is looking for a partner to potentially go after the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Champions, and that, that was one of the reasons that being embarrassed by Lewis Moore and Matt Houston about five weeks ago when they beat Mecca and the number man in like two minutes, uh, a lot of people have, have kind of come to the conclusion that that is the reason for this attack on Lewis Moore and Matt Houston, that Mecca is looking to become a tag team champion and the, the two of you, or possibly just Mecca, are in the process of trying to recruit the perfect partner for him. Well, you know, it's been very obvious in the last year or so I've been, you know, we've been teaming less and less in a, in a tag team sort of role. So, yeah, I've, I've kind of had a little bit to do with him finding a new tag team partner. Well, you put a lot of years in the, in the ring, the bumps and bruises, as have I. It certainly is easier physically here in the booth. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, it became quite apparent me and Mecca were not getting those tag team title shots. Maybe he can with another tag team partner. You felt like the team had plateaued, so to speak. Not through any fault of our own, I don't think. Mecca. Got a hold of Eric Andrews in the corner. Did not stay on him, though. He's backing up. He's creating space in between him. He points to Matt Houston. Oh. Not a good move, though. He should have stayed right on him. You you lose the advantage of that 440 pounds when, you're, when you don't stay on the man, when you create space. Shoulder tackle. Great move from Eric Andrews. Horrible move by Mecca. He really needs to make a tag. Lewis Moore catches him, inverted atomic, and a big right hook. Oh, oh God. Oh, oh, geez, the left hands. The outlaws are fired up after losing that tag team title opportunity. Garrett has no luck. Boom. High knee. Drilled him with it. Watch out for Mecca. And this is what we talked about, the ability of Mecca Mercenary to be a game changer in there. Oh, could be that crossbody. No. Oh, oh God, avalanche him in the buckle. Yeah, this thing is just really broken down here. Well, if Red Jones has kept up, I believe Lewis Moore and Weston are legal. Yes, oh, God, are. choke slam. Oh, oh, God, on the apron. It jars the tailbone and the spine. I think Evan Banks is done. Fighting all over the floor here in this eight-man tag. And I'm looking for Weston. Weston is on the far side with Matt Houston. Evan Banks may be crippled on the floor. Weston still is the legal man. I'm not sure why Red Jones isn't counting him. Smith Garrett is sent to the floor here. This thing is starting to resemble a very ugly car crash. Very ugly. And we got Matt Houston in there with... Man, there's bodies everywhere. 
Oh! The teamwork of the Outlaws is unparalleled. There may be no better team in the Mid-Atlantic that works together as a duo than the Outlaws. Old school revolver got Weston with it. And that'll do it. Bodies are sprawled all over ringside. Legal men are in, and the Outlaws and the Killbillies win it. Twelve minutes, twenty seconds. Your winners by pinfall, the team of the Mid-Atlantic Outlaws and the Killbillies. Bell rings. Big singles action here at Wild Things. Chase Dakota taking on the Rising Generation League champion Chris Lee. Brad Stutz and Cecil Scott are in the booth. And Cecil, a very interesting matchup here. We've got the current Rising Generation League champion, the leader of the Rising Generation, wrestlers with three years or less of professional experience, going up against Chase Dakota, a former RGL champion from years ago, who now Chase is really trying to make his mark in CWF Mid-Atlantic as a singles wrestler. So this is a big match for both men here. Chris Lee's got the opportunity to defeat someone, potentially defeat someone, with a lot of years of ring knowledge under his belt. And Chase Dakota really has got the opportunity to prove that he is just as good as any rising star, any fresh face in the Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it there. Should be a great, honestly, a great athletic wrestling match. But Chase Dakota, I've been saying for a while, he's looking for that one breakout moment. I've always felt like he's got just as much skill as anybody else. He just hasn't had as good of a time putting it all together as, say, a Trevor Lee or an Andrew Everett. I agree with you. I think he's he's ready for that breakthrough night. And, you know, it, it's CWF Mid-Atlantic. You never know what's going to happen. You know, the Weaver Cup was a huge night. We've got the 30-man rumble coming up on October the 5th. That has potential to be a huge, huge night for so many people. It's always a huge night for CWF Mid-Atlantic, but so many guys could potentially have career-defining breakthrough performances in that Rumble match. 
Yeah, Chase Dakota has in the past had one of those big, had, had great rumble moments. In his very first one, he was in the ring upwards of, what, 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, so it's a very, it, it's a very interesting scenario where you got to see guys making the most of these big opportunities. Every event is an opportunity. There's the experience you talked about right there. Positively. And I think that really, that may be kind of the Chase Dakota story in so many words, is he has he has not made the most of every single opportunity, and that's what you have to do. And I think for the first time ever, he's kind of starting to get his head right. He doesn't have a lot of distractions right now. The black watch is not as... Uh, I can't think of the right word I'm looking for, but they're not. their presence isn't felt as much as it used to be, I guess I should say. Maybe the Black Watch is always a threat, but we just haven't seen them as much. Man, those guys creep me out because you never know when they're going to pop up. They're always very kind of leering and looming in the background. But it's kind of forced Chase Dakota to kind of go it on his own, and I think he's made a good accounting for himself the last several shows. Completely agree. These two locked up back at the 350th CWF Mid-Atlantic Live event back in May. Chris Lee squeaked out a victory over the more experienced Dakota in that one. And of course, that entire night, which was filled with magical, memorable moments, is available at ondemand.cwf247.com. And Chase Dakota was coming off of, a, honestly, the victory of his career against Roderick Strong just not long before that. So I was honestly a little surprised Chris Lee got the victory over him that it, night. It really is a story of cover here from Dakota. He could be doing it right here. It really is a story of making the most of every opportunity and of capitalizing on opportunities, of keeping going, keeping the momentum going. And that's been his problem. He hasn't really been able to keep the momentum going. He'll have a, a big moment and then kind of slips away from him in the ensuing shows. Yeah, it's absolutely been his biggest problem throughout the, the entire length of his career, honestly. Maybe we ran into it when we teamed together. We would have, you know, we'd get to the point, we challenge for the tag team titles, and then nothing really works out after that. So, yeah, it's not a recent development by any means. Dakota, we've seen this before, scaling the ropes. You can give the man a bath. Ah! It's hot in here, man. You need to cool down. Stuff is oh. oh, God, he puts a vicious spin to it at the end. Puts two feet in the chest. And of course, Chase was victorious at uh, Weaver Cup Finals night, that three-way dance with McAllister and uh, Aaron Biggs. Showed a lot of smarts in that match. I'll tell you. And being outsmarted in that match could be one of the things that has really kind of pushed McAllister over the edge. Oh, yeah. I think McAllister's he's gone bye-bye in, in the last couple of weeks. A nice uh, stretch here. I don't even know what to call this hold. That's your job, Cecil. Well, he just made it up. I can't call it. I don't have time to be on the internet looking up what these moves are called. Cecil, come on, man. Look, if he's just making stuff up, it's making my job harder. Oh, this is just a good old uh, a version of the ab stretch here. Up to a vertical base here. Chris Lee slips Dakota off. And Chris Lee moving a little sluggish. I don't know if Chase got him with something that we didn't see. Somebody's got to put something together here. Big Ooh. strike from Dakota. How many guys on the roster are really stepping their game up here in the fall? My gosh. And a nice running boot followed up with that, followed that forearm. Good grief. So many guys here are stepping up their game. German. Ooh, big German. No bridge, all impact on that German. Dakota might be on Dream Street. He's seeking refuge in the corner, but he will find none. Big knee into the sternum. Northern Lights. Yes. Got the bridge that time. Pinning position. Almost had him. And he saw he clutched both arms on that Northern Lights. Usually to break out of that pin, he slapped the guy on the side. Chase could not do that this time. Brilliant. That was a great move there. Oh, you got to have a power bomb? Could be. Got him up. Oh, Liger bomb. Good Lord. Planted him. That I think that's it. No. Chris Lee survives it. Man, he landed right on his shoulders and the back of his head on that. 
Chase, what, what we've been talking about, Cecil, he's not following up. He's not making the most of his opportunity. He's not being aggressive enough. He's not staying on top of the man. I don't think he had a follow-up to that, that power. Oh, soul food. Oh, great. Into the cradle. Great move. Two. No. Oh, man, Chris Lee's pinned a lot of guys with that. I can't believe he kicked out. But it's like Chase didn't have a contingency plan after that power bomb and got lost. I think you're 100% right. Good presence of mind, though, to not get pinned. Sends oh. Chris up and over. Nope. Chris Lee with the shoulder tackle. It's like a sunset flip. Big sunset flip. Got him locked in. Drops down. Oh. Got the rope and beat him. Thinking move from Dakota. As good as Chris Lee is, he's still a rookie, and it was a rookie mistake to go for something so close to the ropes. And Chase Dakota with that seven years of experience edge, saw the ropes right there and went right for it. Seven minutes and 20 seconds, your winner by pinfall, Chase Dakota! against Virginia's Brandon Day. Cecil Scott, this one is gonna get violent and ugly, possibly real, real quick. Oh yeah, this is a grown man's match here. And Brandon Day, somebody really capturing the attention of the CWF faithful. A relative newcomer, they've really taken to him. I thought it was a little bit interesting just how much of the CWF Mid-Atlantic crowd is firmly behind Brandon Day here. Zane Dawson has made enemies of us all here at CWF Mid-Atlantic, it seems. Yeah, I mean, nobody likes the guy. And oh, and Brandon Day, I think, is a very interesting technique. He's going to wrestle Zane Dawson. And Zane Dawson will turn this into a fist fight really quick if you let him. Well, Brandon Day's mantra, his motto that he lives by is technical violence, and that may be the best way to beat. Oh, 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 God! He tried to hold on and he slipped. A terrible spill to the ground. We heard him slap off the floor and the mats here. This thing could be over already. A horrible fall. Man, hit the back of his head on this floor, too. I saw it. It was a Cactus Jack-esque sound here in the Sportatorium. The oh. unmistakable sound of flesh and bone clashing onto the floor. Day seems to have his bearings, though. Oh, oh God, he hit the post. He might have cracked his forearm on that. 
Referee up to six. God, this thing might be over before it ever really begins if they don't get in the ring. Absolutely devastating. Brandon Day hit the ground hard, hit the post hard, and now Zane Dawson has taken over. I was just about to say, Brandon Day likes to utilize a style that he calls technical violence. And against a guy like Zane Dawson, if I was Brandon Day, I would want to keep things as technical as possible because I don't think you're going to produce more violence than Zane Dawson. No, Zane Dawson, he's just as fine punching you in the mouth as he is wrestling you, even though this is a mighty fine top wrist. Lock. Dawson can wrestle, make no mistake about it. Oh. Yeah, he and his brother for years have been a great, great tag team across the Carolinas. Cover here only got two, and now we are seeing him step into his own as a singles wrestler, a top contender for so many championships all over the Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, we saw he pushed Eric Royal to the limit not that long ago, a couple of times. They got Brandon Day going for a German. Oh, Zane Dawson able to block it. Very smart move, hooked that toe around the back of the leg. And he's going right back to that arm. We don't know the severity of how, how badly that arm of Brandon Day is. But it's not getting any better if Zane Dawson keeps going after it. A nice single arm DDT there. Boy, Brandon Day has got a lot of fight in him, but it is tough to come back from a couple of big, heavy blows. It, it, it's not the same as hitting a, a man, hitting a wrestler in a, in a move or in a hold. You, you know, Cecil, you've been in the ring. You, you can, you can touch on this. You, you know, even if you can't necessarily do anything about it, you anticipate, you anticipate the blow. You've got your, uh, you know, adrenaline flowing. You, you know what's coming. When you just lose your footing like that, and all of a sudden you're on the ground, it's, it's, it's jarring. It's stunning. It almost put you in a state of shock because you, you weren't expecting it the same way that you were expecting uh, maybe, you know, a clothesline or a drop kick or whatever. You had no anticipation. It came right out of nowhere and just blindsided him. Yeah, you're exactly right. And adding the fact that in his mind, he had held on to the ropes. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things. He was not expecting that drop. You know, in the ring, you're on guard at all times. Even when you're on offense, you know that a, a drop kick, a clothesline, anything could be coming from any direction. And a lot of times we see the momentum in matches change when a guy gets blindsided or when a guy lets his guard down and he, he doesn't, he's not prepared for anything. In the ring, it just kind of goes with the territory. You prepare for anything. Look at those big body shots from Man. Dawson. What a beast. And Brandon Day a lot like an Eric Royal to where he's a lot more effective when he's coming forward. Maybe not as strong defensively, and we're seeing that. Heads up. Ducks two. Brandon Day is going to make something happen. Two knees right into the beard of Dawson. And a lot of momentum behind those knees, too, and it's a big man. Day's going to take another chance, and he does. Oh. He flies through the air. Right into the front row, my gosh. And a lot, you don't see a lot of guys that size doing suicide dives like that. Unbelievable athlete is Brandon Day. I get the feeling this is, this is an athlete that's gonna go a long way, I think. I think in a year's time, we're gonna see a belt around this man's waist. A veteran of all oh. over the mid-Atlantic, just coming to CWF this year. Uh-oh, could be the lariat. Dawson is Slow. priming that arm. No! no! Oh, that oh, that was maybe not a great move. Horrible, horrible mistake from Day. I think just out of instinct, he stuck with that big roaring elbow. But the pain in his arm clearly getting the better of him as referee Joey Hogan is having to check on him. Like you said, he could have a broken wrist or any number of things could be broken in that arm. Yeah, it could be broken. It could be anything down to a torn ligament. Cover. Only got two. Ref Joey Hogan was right there. But I think it was that, that those precious seconds that saw uh, Zane be able to, to kind of shake it off enough to get out. But he's still not on his feet. He's still hurting. But Brandon Day is hurt bad. Yeah, Brandon Day's got to reassess what he can exactly do to hurt Zane Dawson at this point with that hurt arm. Oh. And that shoulder hit that. Oh. oh! The Lariat, the most dangerous Lariat in wrestling. And I think it just knocked Brandon Day out. 
think that's exactly what happened. And Day hit that arm in the buckle before that lariat, too. That had to stun him a little. Brandon Day is hurt bad, and Zane Dawson has won another one. 15 seconds, seconds your winner by pinfall, Zane Dawson. Would you please welcome out team number one, the tag team of Jason Miller and the Lost Cause, Nick Richards. in that eight-man tag match earlier tonight. Cecil Scott, is there any rivalry in the Mid-Atlantic right now that is fiercer than Richards and Miller against Donnie Dollars? No, this is a battle that won't end. And more so the fact that Donnie just can't ever seem to get his hands on Nick Richards. Very interesting scenario here in this one as you've got two smaller, more kind of uh, reckless type wrestlers teaming with two big powerhouses. The teams here are very evenly matched. You know, Lance Lude can wrestle, Nick Richards can wrestle, but normally Lance Lude goes to reckless high flying and normally Richards prefers reckless brawling. So it's a very even tag team matchup here when you look at the two teams. Very much so, and it's two guys that a lot of times do just as much damage to themselves as they do their opponent. Great move there from Lance Lude. But we're seeing the wrestling you talked about. This is a matchup that on paper intrigues me a whole lot. Lance Lude against Nick Richards. But Richards is going to seek solace on the apron and get the difference maker, Jason Miller, in there. Miller, no emotion, cold, nothing phases this guy. And we're gonna see the two big men here, but yeah, Jason Miller, ever since that, uh, that DDT hurt around the world a few months ago, has this been, I don't know, he looks dead, dead inside, dead in the eyes. 
very much so. We see him kind of squaring off with Donnie Dollars here. They've been at war for months and months and months, as you alluded to, ever since the 350th CWF event when Jason Miller joined the lost cause of Nick Richards. Donnie doing a little bit better job of keeping his composure tonight. Normally, when he gets near Richards and Miller, he kind of just goes blank with rage. And Richards, from behind, kind of takes advantage of it. And we might see that rage in a second now. Great move there. Oh, boy. A smart move by Jason Miller. Get the heck out of there. If there's one thing that Miller does so, so well, it is pull Nick Richards' fat out of the fire. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Oh, God! Oh, God! We talked about the recklessness, and there it was. Lance Lude thrown like a javelin onto Richards and Miller. And that was a case where Donnie's power uh, came in, it came in uh, handy in a way you wouldn't expect. Richards is getting marked up with chops on the floor as the two legal men settle back into the ring. And as a case with most matches involving Richards and Miller, it is already not pretty. Their oh. matches tend to get a little ugly. Red Jones is right. Dying Dollars did tag Lute in. Oh. oh, God, top of his head hit the apron. And Jason Miller just tagged him right back out with that clothesline. Lance Lute is the legal man. Donnie tagged him in right before that big dive. Great officiating there from referee Red Jones. And now we've got a problem if you're Donnie Dollars and Lance Lude because the smaller man not only has just been decimated and crashed into the floor, but he's still legal and now he's been isolated. Yeah, that was the one thing they did not want to happen. You never want the small man of the team to get cut off. Slams him hard on the floor. And I'm trying to look. What is Richards doing? Cactus elbow! And it has silenced the Sportatorium. And that was past those blue mats. That was on the concrete. Deliberate. Oh, yeah, very deliberate. And if I'm Richards and Miller, I would take the count out at this point. This building is silenced. Lance Lude could be seriously compromised at this point. And Donnie trying to get back over there. Red Jones stopped him. Lude has got a glazed over look in his eyes as Richards and Miller continue to double team him. Like you pointed out earlier, Cecil, Richards and Miller just literally just cold eyes, dead inside. So little motivation, so little whatever that they don't even bother getting dressed anymore. They just wear whatever they're wearing to the building. And there's, you know, most almost every wrestler has some kind of motivation going in there, whether it be money or title belts or just, you know, pride. I don't know what these two fight for. I don't either. I honestly don't. You know, Richards and I have been close over the years, but I mean, it, it, it's been months since I could talk to him. And that that's a legitimate, true statement. It has been months since I really felt like, it, it's been months since I really felt like I knew where Richards was coming from. And it's, I don't even think it's a case where they like hurting people. It's just that they go in there just to do it. Tag back into Miller. <laughs> They've done a great job isolating Lance Lude, but you're right. Like for as far as Richards and Miller goes, what is the end game here? What is what's their motivation? Are they, you know, if you if you if you care so little, if you uh, detest wrestling and everything about it so much, then why be here? Why show up? Why make the attempt to be here? That's the part that I can't figure out with Richards and Miller. If they hate wrestling so much, and they, oh, whenever you do talk to them, it's wrestling breaks your heart. Wrestling is a cruel mystery. If they detest it so much, why are they here? What is their motivation? What's the end game of this crusade that they're on? And if I had to venture a guess, if there is any motivation, it's a case of misery loves company. They'd want everybody else to be just as miserable as they are. You really might be right. You know, I've made I've made that remark in months past without really thinking about the ramifications of it, but you might be 100% right in that in that instance. I think they, they feel like if they could get in here and beat up somebody that the fans love, like a Donnie Dollars or a Lance Lude, they're making the fans miserable. And that, I don't know, simple as it may be, that might be enough for them. Richards is back legal. And they're really doing a number on Lance Lude right now. High Beautiful. belly to back. Beautiful belly to back suplex. Very high and tight on that. 
And you said earlier, we got a hush silence over this crowd. I think they really are concerned right now about Lance Lude. If he gets to Donnie Dollars, that's going to be a massive, major game changer. But if he does not, then we could see this kid get hurt very, very badly right now because one, uh, one of the bad things about being in the sport so small, it's not that he's not a phenomenal athlete, it's that he's got less muscle mass, less weight to, to, to cushion the blow on these big, hard falls that he takes. Yeah, there's less to absorb all the impact. Oh, smart move. Great move, great opening there. Uses, him, uses Miller to pull himself up, goes all the way up and down. Great move. Very Great move. And I think if he's got a good opportunity to tag, this is going to be it. Oh, Richard's right there. They have the swarm mentality. Duck of the ends of Curry. Oh. oh, God, he spat right in Donnie's face. Donnie's going to kill him. Oh, God, Donnie oh. did get him. And he has finally gotten Rick Richards exactly where he wants him. Pummelin the man in the corner. Is this going to be the boot? I think it might be the boot. I watched, I watched Jason. Oh, Miller tackles him all the way through the ropes. I don't, Lance Lude never got to the tag. No, Lance Lude and Richards are still legal. Oh. Oh, got him in the back of the head. Beautiful drop kick. Right on the button there. And Lance Lude's really got to gut it out now. He never got to that tag. He got a minute and a half. Lance Lude charges, goes for the monkey flip. No, got nothing. Richards trying to block it. He does. Lude slips out of it. Cutter, no. no. Steps through. Hooks through. Could be the Cristo. And he got him. Yep, the Cristo hole locked in. Miller. Miller's going to make the save. No, Donnie's got Miller. Miller not there to make the save. And Richards taps. Richards, but only for fleeting moments. But Cecil, we just saw it. If you separate the two, if you take Miller out of the equation, we just saw it. That's how you beat Nick Richards. That's right. It seems like the whole operation falls apart when you separate them. Yeah, the whole operation. The whole operation falls apart when you separate the two men. And we saw that perfect example as soon as he locked in that hold. Ladies and gentlemen, our next bout tonight is scheduled for singles action. One fall with a 10-minute time limit. Please welcome back, Manny Garcia! I'm calling you out right now, you fat piece of crap. You need to come right here in front of everybody. Everybody and get some of Manny Garcia. How old
Garcia, not waiting for the bell. Cecil Scott here with joined in the booth by the Rising Generation League champion, Show Smooth Chris Lee, and your buddy uh, Aaron Biggs kind of got the drop on him there. Cecil, first of all, I just want to say I'm glad we can put our differences aside just for these few moments just for so a few we can moments. do commentary right here. That was pretty cheap by Manny Garcia. This is one of the guys I have to look out for in the Rising Generations League, man. Absolutely, man. Big, a, very, a very impressive young rookie. Um, kind of had a little bit of bad luck to start his career with Rob the Boogie Woogie Man McBride. But he's really taking it to your good buddy here, Aaron Biggs. In the short time he's been here, he's made a huge splash. But the thing that I'm looking for right now is me and Aaron have been training together. We've been making sure we've been working out together. Biggie Smooth is in the building. He hasn't been wrestling for three months. Three months. He I'm had one see, match. I just want to see where Manny Garcia's uh, his, his stamina and his cardio is at. Yeah, that's going to be the question. You can work out all you want, but unless you're in that ring, and you know this just as well as I do, there's a whole different animal being in the ring than just being in the gym. Right now, he needs to stop worrying about the crowd. He needs to get back into the ring. See? Costly mistake right there. And that's that's one of those things, you know, not being in the ring, you kind of forget how much of an effect the crowd can have on you. You forget how to tune them out. Exactly. And Oh, oh wow. man. And, you know, three months ago, he lost to Rob McBride, with stipulation being that he had to leave for three months. He just he just got off the boat. Exactly. And and for those three months, he was out oh. of the country. Wow, that was a big super, uh, suplex right there. Yeah, he went back He's out of the country, going back to uh, Dominican Republic. I don't even know if there's a ring there. I don't know if he got a chance to train. I don't know if he got a chance to hit those ropes. I don't oh, think, wow. I don't think they have running water down there. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh! oh. Very smart movies. I mean, the, the brains are still there, at least. He looks oh. like he's dropped about 15 pounds. Oh, oh, oh wow. God. But his power didn't go anywhere, obviously. Man alive. And I know firsthand how strong Aaron Biggs is. That is no small feat, what we just saw. Where's my flag? He's looking for his flag. Where is the man's flag? He should just worry about the match right now instead of worrying about his flag. He has the man down right here. I would probably go for a cover, grab a hold, something. He needs to try to win this match instead of putting his attention towards the crowd. Yeah, something. I mean, he's got to do something only one man has done before, and that's pin Aaron Biggs. It's no right. small feat. No small feat indeed. Mecca Mercenary, the only man to pin Aaron Biggs. Oh. Wow. I felt that before from him. That, oh, wow. I know you've, you've trained with Manny Garcia somewhat. And we faced off before in another organization. And his kicks, his knees, his punches, they are lethal. Trust me on that. And hey, you got a guy here, I'd say he goes at least 6'3", six, 6'4", six, or so, wouldn't you say? Probably a good mm. 260. This is oh, a wow. big, big kid. Well, he's dropped some weight when uh, when he was away, so he's probably down to maybe 230 right now. Oh, yeah, I mean, you eat Dominican food for three months. <laughs> Man. Yeah. And plus, it was over the summertime. It was pretty sweltering hot. You probably sweat all that off. I know. I saw that in those videos he was sending in. This is exactly what he needs to do. He needs to ground and pound the big man. He needs to make sure that he uh, keeps him down. Because Aaron, trust me, he is tough. He is strong. He was in a car accident earlier this week. Yeah, just this week. And got hit by 18-wheeler. T-boned him on the driver's side. And he's still here. He's wrestling six days later. Yeah, you couldn't even tell it by looking at him. Yeah, this is a big, big, strong guy, and he's just, he works very, very hard. I've had my differences with him, but he works very hard to improve. And you see, it's just night and day looking at him now from where he was at five, six months ago. Exactly. I'd like to think I brought something out of him. I, I think I might have to try, try to take a little bit of credit from that because me and him have been training together. You know, Biggie Smooth, we stay tight. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's become one of my best friends here at CWF in the last few months. And we got a little bit of a slugfest here. This is oh. really not what Manny Garcia oh, wants to do. cheap shot right here. And that was smart. I mean, you can't slug it out with Aaron Biggs. It's smart, but it's illegal. I wish the referee would step in and, and, and do something about that. I don't think the referee saw it. Oh! Took way too much time right there. Oh, man. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Just leveled him. Get on a big man. Get on a big man. You got to pin him. And I think Manny wants to get back on the boat now. <laughs> I think this is a mistake by my friend uh, Aaron Biggs right here. Yeah. I think he should have tried to go for the pin right there. Yeah, don't wait for the man to get up. But, you know, he's wrestling for six months. You know, Things like that will come to him. Oh, oh, here we go. And I've been on the wrong end of this. This is the biggie roll right here. Oh, oh, he, is he holding on to the ropes? Oh, he got oh. it. 
He got it. And that is it. That should be it. I wish I was coming off the top rope right here or on top of his shoulders. One, two. And big, big win for your boy there. Aaron Biggs. Biggs. That's my boy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, your winner by pinfall. Five minutes and seven seconds. Aaron Biggs! My boy, Chris Lee, bring it Tonight. And for the CWF Mid Atlantic Television title, this bout is scheduled for one fall, the 10 minute time limit. Please welcome your challenger tonight, Jet Curly! Show Smooth Lee, the V5 title defense for Manny De Niro. And I'd say he's got a pretty tough challenge against uh, Chet Sterling, who's yeah. look, really looking to regain some momentum after Weaver Cup Finals night. He is. Chet Sterling is, uh, we, me and him started around the same time professionally, and uh, he's one of the guys I have my eye on as far as this Rising, Gener Ra Rising Generations League championship. And uh, he has a real chance of winning this thing. Right I think so. I mean, he's obviously been probably your toughest rival since you debuted. You've been each other's toughest rival. And up until last, exactly. up until that loss against Lee Valiant, he went several months without a loss. He was some three, four months undefeated. I'll tell you what, Chet Sterling has had it pretty good. If you think about it, at one time, he was in a group with Xyrus, 
with Converse, with Trevor Lee and Ben Tyler. Now, right now, he's just with Trevor Lee. However, he's learned so much, gained so much valuable experience from teaming with all four of those guys. He's definitely ahead as a rookie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he got a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge right out of the gate. And I have to wonder, well, I'm, I'm curious to see where his mind is. This is the first time he's suffered a major setback in momentum. And I want to see how he reacts being a young wrestler. And this is honestly, a lot of people wouldn't get a big opportunity like this off of such a big loss. But Chet deserves it. He has the he has the tools to get it done. He knows all the tricks. All the you see that right there. Yeah, very That's smart. That's very much illegal. But he's going to try to get in Maddie's head. He better watch it. He better not try to hit Joey. Joey will definitely hit him back. Yeah, Joey uh, operates on a different mentality than many other people. But he's got the right amount of aggressiveness here. He just does. He's going to get disqualified. Oh, wow. wow. Maddie was a little surprised. Can Joey disqualify himself? I think I disqualified Joey. What the oh. hell? What oh. is this? Oh. And he kicked out. <laughs> Can that happen? Can that really happen? Joey almost won the match. Yeah, but for Maddie, <laughs> I don't think that would have stood. <laughs> this, is, this is ridiculous. Because technically, if it's a match between you two, I'd be the referee, so then I have to disqualify you then. But if I can't hit you, I can't hit this guy. Then who can I hit? Stop. This way, this one over. Yeah, hit me. Come on. Where's you taking me? It looks like you can't hit anyone, but I can hit you. What? Oh wow. Oh wow. Oh nice atomic drop. Oh, oh, another one. Chet Sterling got caught up in the uh the legendary mind games of Matty De Niro. Oh Matthew De Niro, very famous for nice. playing mind games. And a nice sliding D the elbow there. See? Chet was trying to get into his, oh, just the two count. Chet was trying to get into his mind earlier. Looks like Matty reversed that and got back in Chet's mind. He is the veteran in this, but Chet is still, he's still a slippery guy, man. He could probably pull it out. Whoa, man, I thought he had him there with a nice counter. Matty nice landed on his feet. Oh, oh. oh, oh that was beautiful. Vicious. Beautiful swing and neck breaker there. Yeah, Chet, his own, uh, his own aggression and mentality kind of played against him in that earlier exchange. He really let Maddie get in his head. And a really tight, kind of a, you know, kind of a reverse chin lock in a way. Except he's, I think he's putting the bones of his wrist right in the top of his eye socket. So it's, oh, yeah. it's really hurting him. He's really wrenching back on that right now. Hey, Chet's really got to find an opening here. Otherwise, he's going to be toast in a couple of minutes. That was a nice oh. drop kick. That was nice. He needs to stop he needs celebrating. To go for the cover. He needs to go for the cover right here. And I got to ask you, Chris Lee, if you look at somebody like Chet Sterling, if he's able to knock off the television champion, you know, what kind of mentality do you have? Do you think, hey, I'm on the same experience level? You know what? Do you think it's time for me to make that jump? That raises the bar for, for me because the way I've always seen it, and I've said this before, Chet and I, to me, are on a parallel level here at CWF. I just happen to be the Rising Generations League champion. Me and him started around the same time. We've had equal amount of success minus a, a title for him. That puts him on an even playing field with me, and it makes us the two best rookies here. We have to slug it out again. Yeah, you have to. And I, honestly, I know it would motivate me to want to say, hey, maybe I should go after the TV titles or the tag titles or something along those lines. You know, it's kind of it's kind of signifies, hey, I've really made it into the big time. And Matty De Niro, probably the, you know, more than anybody, this guy is a fighter. He's, he's somebody who will never quit in that ring, no matter what. Give him some nice jabs right there. Hopefully he can capitalize on these. A nice reversal there. Check going high on that clothesline. Maddie goes high. Oh! Beautiful light oh, there. Oh, wow! He might that have it. That could be it right there. One, two, three. Oh! That was two and three quarters. I felt that move before. That move is so much harder than a regular lariat. 
just the leg is so much heavier. It has so much, the bone is denser, the muscle is denser, and it comes right there on your throat. It's, that's very tough to kick out of. I mean, the average human leg goes, what, 15, 20 pounds? And then, you, then, you know, there's always that chance that the rest of his weight's gonna come down with it. I, I'm not real versed on uh, science words, but whatever the bone is called in your thigh, that is the toughest bone in your body. That is your Imagine that coming femur. Down on, your femur. Yes. Imagine that coming down on your throat. Full speed off the ropes like that. I want to tell you right now, Chris Lee, I study legs a lot. Are you studying legs right now? Right now. Right during now. During this match. During this match. I, I, I definitely understand that. I'm not going to make any incriminating comments. No, thank you. I feel like we've really buried our hey, hatchet. Babe, how are you doing over there? Yeah, my girlfriend's in the, in the uh, Your secret's stands. safe with me, Chris Lee. <laughs> oh, wow. And he missed that big splash in the corner. Maddie's going to go to, I really, I can't even talk. Stinger splash, oh, no. Just missed it. And Chad, Chad just needs to go ahead and capitalize on this. He needs to stop trying to be fancy. Oh, oh block block move. This could be it right here. This could be it. You're looking at a new television champion. You're looking. Oh, I just got that shoulder up. May need a little bit deeper cover there. You're right. If he had a little bit deeper cover, if he would have held down those. Ah, oh, he's trying to get it right here. Had a handful of tights, too. <laughs> if he could have held down those shoulders, held that leg just a little bit harder, maybe he could have been a new television champion right now. Or grab the tights with both hands. No, we have to do this the right way. What is, what is Chet doing? I think he's going for that moonsault. He has a pretty moon. Oh! Oh! And I just got the word from our ring announcer. Two and a half minutes remain in the time limit. Oklahoma roll. Yep, just oh. under two and a half minutes. How is he back up? Oh! Super kick, that's his move. T-bone. T-bone. Oh! This has to be it. And a successful B5 title effort. defense by Matty De Niro. Great. Very good match. Chet Sterling made a good count for himself, though. He looked very good. I guarantee you, Chet will get another opportunity at some championship, maybe even oh, mine down the line. I think he'll make good on it next time. We'll see about that. Your Atlantic Television Champion, Matthew De Niro. You're my best friends ever. What? Uh, I'm gonna switch tiers now. As I've just defended the CWF Television Championship for the fifth time. Thank you, Firemaster. I defeated a legend in Kamikaze Kid. I defeated an android and I slayed a dragon. Chip Day can cuss me, but I beat him. Chet Sterling thought he had better chops than me, but I beat him at that too. Aha! Yeah. But now it's time to get serious. Arguably, 2013 has been the greatest year of Maddie De Niro's career. And I don't even think you gotta argue that. Yeah. But I've done a lot. Sort of started out National Pro Wrestling Day in Philadelphia, teaming with the Hurricane victoriously in Philly, winning in Philly, imagine that. Yeah! <laughs> and then, there was the end of March. I've not forgotten about that. But from that little situation, I managed to recover. And on June 1st, 2013, I defeated Trevor Lee for the television championship. And after eight long years, holding gold, or silver, or platinum, feels really good. But, over the past couple months, I've 
spoken to some fans and they've asked me, Matty De Niro, what's your end game? Was it the television championship? Is that all you wanted? When I was a member of Fatback Enterprises, when my music hit, the first things you heard were, I want it all and I want it now. My end game is not the television championship. The paperwork has been made. And at the CWF Rumble, Eric Royal will defend his CWF Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship against Matty De Niro, who will defend his CWF Television Championship. It's champion versus champion, title against title, winner take all at the CWF Rumble. Endless. I'm waiting on you on the 21st, Eric. I want you to tell me to my face. You accept my challenge. The ultimate challenge. Please welcome the winner of the 2013 Johnny Weaver Cup Tournament, Rahel Hunto Trevor Lee. As we touched on earlier tonight, both Weaver Cup finalists were rewarded. Trevor Lee had the option to pick his opponent tonight and declined. He said anyone that wanted to take up an open challenge was welcome to do so. No, sir. Studs getting himself back together. Joining me over here. What a bizarre situation we have here. What a bizarre situation. Roy Wilkins apparently has left the All-Stars. And this situation with the All-Stars is the answers are kind of, well, the questions are kind of answering themselves more and more as we go along. Roy Wilkins with new music and not wearing the ring attire of the Goon Squad or the All-Stars. You know, we have not seen the All-Stars.
All-Stars in months and months. And really, ever since Absolute Justice was the last time we saw the All-Stars all together. Uh, it, you know, it, it really seems like this group has split up, and Roy Wilkins is hearing the cheers of the crowd here tonight, Cecil yeah, Scott. It's been a long time since he's heard that, and honestly, since Absolute Justice, we only saw the Goon Squad one time, or I should say we saw Roy Wilkins one time when he lost in his bid in the Weaver Cup to Trevor Lee in the first round. We have yet to see Walter Eaton. We haven't seen, well, Ray Kandrak has been retired, obviously. Right, Ray Kandrak forced to leave earlier this year by Commissioner Dangerous E. Corey Edsel prior to Corey Edsel being, uh, well, parting ways with CWF Mid-Atlantic. But this is an interesting matchup. You touched on it, Cecil. These two met in the very first round of the Weaver Cup. They fought uh, a phenomenal match. They fought to the 15-minute time limit. And with, you know, 200-plus here in the Mid-Atlantic Sportatorium calling for five more minutes, five more minutes were granted. Trevor Lee got the win, but Roy Wilkins brought up a great point. Trevor Lee, a time limit draw in the first round. He beat a, an injured Andrew Everett in the semifinals. And Trevor Lee and Lee Valiant fought to a double countout. So realistically, Trevor Lee, the tournament that he won, realistically, he should have been eliminated three times in it. Yeah, conceivably so, yeah. I mean, he caught a, caught a couple of really good breaks on those draws that the referees restarted the match. And Trevor Lee, I don't, I can kind of look at him right now. The last guy he was expecting was Roy Wilkins. The last guy any of us were. You know, we haven't seen the All-Stars in months. And it, we talked earlier about Michael McAllister's kind of uh, descent into madness. And it looks like maybe the opposite effect of Roy Wilkins. Roy Wilkins looks in great shape uh, and is here to take on Trevor Lee mano a mano here. A very interesting turn of events here at Wild Things. And one thing we haven't touched on, we it never really gets brought up, is that the coach was more or less ousted from the group to begin with. Yeah, when Roy Wilkins... Wilkins lost that first round tournament matchup. Jesse Ortega, Michael McAllister, and Roy Wilkins all uh, confronted the coach and basically they all walked out on him. All right, and we haven't seen the coach since then. So, I mean, obviously, that, like him or not, that was the glue that was holding this whole thing together and they pulled it apart. One of the most dominant groups ever in CWF Mid Atlantic history seems to have broken apart. And we're going to see if the time off has affected Roy Wilkins in a negative way or a positive way. And it seems so far that he's content to wrestle with uh, with Trevor Lee. Aside, you know, kick to the chest aside. Well, I mean, you know, Roy Wilkins was as underhanded a, a guy, a competitor as we had in the Mid-Atlantic for a number of years, really ever since he came out of the tutelage of the All-Stars and the coach. But for years prior to that, Roy Wilkins was a very popular rising star here in CWF Mid-Atlantic before he fell under the tutelage of the coach. And even when he was with the coach, this guy was still a phenomenal wrestler and a tough guy, the winner of last year's CWF Rumble. Right. So this guy's a tough guy, a survivor, and a true wrestler. He was the one who was personally mentored the most by the coach. So he has a lot of tools in his arsenal here uh, to potentially defeat Trevor Lee. And, and as the shoulders are down here, he's got a lot of arsenals uh, to potentially defeat Trevor Lee and, and really justify his claim that he should have been the Weaver Cup champion. All right, and I feel like he's one of the few guys that can actually get down there on that mat with Trevor Lee and, and hold his own. Man, look at that athleticism. Oh, got him by the hair, pulls him back in. Great move. And Chet was trying to tell him to look out. Yeah, we should mention that Chet Sterling has made his way to ringside. Chet Sterling, the apprentice of the Aftermath group, has really, you know, when there were five of them, uh, it was his, his role was certainly more clear. He was the young boy, the whipping boy, so to speak, of the Aftermath. Now that it's pretty much just Trevor and Chet, you know, Trevor uses him opportunistically but treats him pretty much as an equal and a tag team partner. Shockingly so, yes. It's kind of odd for Trevor to think of anyone as an equal. I got to say one thing, though. As fate would have it, Lee Valiant in a tremendous effort, which we will see him rewarded for later tonight with a tag team title shot. Lee Valiant put up a tremendous effort in the Weaver Cup, defeated Chet Sterling in the semifinals, and moved on uh, to face Trevor Lee in the finals. I got to say, despite how it seems that Trevor Lee treats Chet, 
We'll never know just how Trevor Lee would have reacted if it had wound up him and Chet in the tournament finals. I, you're right about that. Maybe. It seems on the surface like these guys are partners, that, you know, they're a team. But we'll never know just how Trevor Lee would have reacted had Chet wound Ooh. up in the finals. Wilkins, man, that side of the ring is just cursed tonight. Same side of the ring that Brandon Day took a tumble on. Oh, Such boy. The kick. No, did not get the kick. Had it scouted. These two did meet earlier this year and this summer in the Weaver Cup tournament, as we pointed out. And, and so then, Wilkins knew what to expect, Cecil. And to answer your point, I think Trevor Lee would push his mother down the stairs to have won that Weaver Cup. I completely agree. Absolutely agree. Oh, great Tilt move. Tilt backbreaker. Trevor Lee wants nothing more than to be recognized universally as the best wrestler alive. And I think you're 100% right. I think Trevor Lee would have stabbed anyone in the back to win that tournament, up to and including in especially Chet. We will never know as fate uh, did not present that matchup in the course of the tournament. But and I certainly suspect it. Yeah, and if Chet had been involved in that main event and had done anything that caused Trevor Lee that match, you would have seen what he really thinks about him. That's another great point. But Wilkins has looked great here as we have speculated on the tournament. Like we said, had moves scouted, looking good. And, and you know, like you said, with, with one or two, other than one or two little things, pretty much fought a clean matchup. Yeah. You know, you know, old, old, old habits are hard to, hard to get rid of, but beautiful backbreaker. And honestly, doesn't look like he's lost a step. The time off hasn't really hurt him. We may see that in his conditioning if the match draws out. Trevor Lee, you know, he's really got a – I think he feels some pressure to keep up that momentum from the Weaver Cup Finals. I think you're right. I think he understands that his his credibility as the tournament champion, and that's what he wants. He wants the recognition. Trevor Lee wants the credit. And it's tough to accept the credit if you lose the very next match. Yeah. People will say that maybe Roy was right. Maybe Roy deserved to win the tournament. Maybe it was a fluke. So this is a very intriguing matchup. You know, when Trevor Lee declined uh, the opportunity to pick his own opponent, I really, you know, was not sure who was going to show up. You know, Andrew Everett wrestling uh, out of state this weekend. Eric Royal on a promotional uh, obligation up in the state of Ohio. We got a couple of the top guys not with us tonight. But, you know, honestly, my, my gut reaction, I really thought a younger guy was going to step up. Maybe like like an Aaron Biggs or Chris Lee or somebody like that, even, you know, oh, God, stopped him right on the chest. You know, somebody like a Manny Garcia, anybody looking to make a name for themselves, say, hey, I beat the Weaver Cup champion. You know, and the Weaver Cup champion is more or less the standing number one contender to that heavyweight title. He has a guaranteed future opportunity. It is not a money in the bank type situation. He's got to call his shot. It is not something that he can spring on the champion spur of the moment. Double team right there. Oh, kick the turnbuckle, send it right into the face. Good grief. They might have loosened the jaw of Roy Wilkins. And you're right, I mean, it's, it's a, a, title, a title opportunity. It has to be, you know, the ink has to be on the paper for that. And speaking of the heavyweight title, the announcement by Matty De Niro earlier. You know, I've been friends with Matty for a long time outside of professionally, and I, it has always been his goal to one day be the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, a goal that until this year seemed uh, implausible because he had never been a champion in CWF. Oh. He's going for that German. Roy Wilkins able to counter it. Went for that backbreaker again. Trevor's going to get that kick. He's poised for it. He's letting Roy know where he is, though. That could be a mistake. Oh. Good grief. Roy Wilkins took two really hard shots to the face back to back. First that kick in the buckle, then the kick right to the face. Man alive. Unreal at the sound bounced off the walls here at the Mid-Atlantic Sportatorium. And, you know, we spoke about Matty De Niro. I think if Eric Royal accepts that challenge, we are in for a very good title match. Matty, it is a dream come true to potentially be the Mid-Atlantic champion. It's an interesting match on paper. The 
the outrageousness of Matty De Niro against just the, the brute power and the force of Eric Royal. Big stomp to the face, big boot to the face, rather. Oh, boy. Victory roll. No. Did, oh, God, look at the power of Trevor Lee. Man, caught him in midair. He likes that Everest-style German suplex. Could have been the three count right there. Great power by Trevor Lee. We've spoke before, the, the kid is deceptively powerful. Trevor looks like he is hurt, uncharacteristically. Usually he pops up so quick. He almost, you know, makes concentrated effort to show that he's not hurt. I think I, he's playing possum. Might be, oh boy. No, kid got nothing. Roy's got these moves scouted. Needs to follow up though. Golf swing scouted. Took too long to set it up. Absolutely did. One second too long is all it took. Woo! Drop kick, precise. You know, Trevor may have had his bell rung for a moment. When you do a German suplex like that, and we cover, there's always a chance that the man will land on your head when you go for that bridge. It really requires arguably more technique than anything else to, to really make sure that you don't get your own bell rung, as you alluded to. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I think all of us have been in that situation. You know, you go for a move and have a guy land not quite where you wanted him to. And Roy, every time it seems like Trevor's got one up on him, Roy manages to fight back. Roy's got a fire we have not seen recently, but he got caught in that lift suplex. Man, love that gut wrench right into the cover. You notice Trevor Lee had his knee right on Wilkins' face. Just adds a little something to that cover. And very interesting, it had a waist lock, which you don't see on a whole lot of pin attempts. Through the moonlight drive, no, did not get it. Send him into the buckle instead. Trevor Lee charges. Catches that boot again. Trevor seems a little confused. Hot shots him into the buckle. Look at Roy Wilkins here, man. Oh, golf swing got him. He might have him. Got to follow up, though. Roy Wilkins might have got his bell rung earlier. Hey, what is Chet doing? Bad move on the official's part to let Chet interrupt the count. He did not interrupt the pinfall. Bad move on the official's part. And what? Oh. He Man, got by. nothing. Managed to counter that suplex. Oh, got the moonlight drive. I don't think he got all of it, but he did twerk the neck and dropped him hard. I really don't want to see Roy Wilkins twerk. The neck, the neck. And what does it do for Roy Wilkins if he manages to pin the Weaver Cup champion? What does that do for the standing? Validity is what it does. It validates his claim that he never needed the All-Stars. It validates his claim that he did not need Coach Gemini. And it validates his claim that Trevor Lee should not have won the turn. Oh, oh. God, the knee! He didn't get the full extension like he normally does, but man, it rocked him. You want to talk about getting your bell rung? Pat is down now. No! Wilkins needs to make something happen. No! Like Take sweet. Super kick! Wilkins is absolutely stunned. And we might see an orange crush. Yeah, I think that's exactly what he's going for. It is. No, great move from Wilkins. Like I said, these two guys have got each other's moves scouted. Oh, God! Wait, that was a... Almost a Canadian destroyer. Referee is going to allow it. It was a desperation move. I think it was. It, Roy is saying that it was the momentum. Charles Richardson is going to allow it, but Roy needs to make the cover. He's saying it was an accident. Charles Richardson Charles. begrudgingly is allowing the Canadian destroyer. Oh, Roy Wilkins just about snuck one past everybody there. I haven't seen him use that in about six years. He won the RGL title with that in 2006. The pile driver was made illegal in CWF Mid-Atlantic years ago. Wilkins is arguing that the momentum carried him over. Wilkins trying to sneak one past <laughs> everybody here. The oh. cleverness of the All-Stars still in Wilkins' vocabulary. Well, speaking of clever, Trevor popped that rope. Oh. God, kicked him in the face. That could be a knockout blow. No, only two. Yeah, he snapped that rope in the eye of Roy Wilkins. Oh, Roy's momentum, you know, took him right over the top rope. That was a dumb move on Wilkins' part, because even if he had connected with something, it would have sent Trevor Lee to the floor. No, In no scenario was that a match-ending move that Wilkins was charging going for. A little bit of a uh, desperation, like, as you said. Oh. Knee strike got nothing. Wilkins is not going to get hit with that knee strike if he has any chance at all. Crisscrossing. Oh, kicked him in the head. High roundhouse.
else. Trevor has connected with the kicks, but he has not connected with the knees. And that one knee that he got wasn't, like you said, it wasn't the full effect. He, that, that big kill shot, that leaping knee strike, Roy Wilkins has pretty much checked it out of the vocabulary and the playbook of Trevor Lee. Right. And aside from a couple of mistakes, I think this is the best showing I've seen from Roy Wilkins in a long time. Certainly the best single showing. Wilkins predominantly a tag team wrestler with Walter Eaton. Now he's got the tight. Ducks won. Crossbody! Oh, no, Trevor caught up. him. Man. It was like two planes colliding in the air. But Trevor used the momentum to get he got the good end of that. And is really how good is this kid? I mean, they're unbelievable. Both these guys are unbelievable athletes, but you're right. The Weaver Cup champion, Trevor Lee, who is not even 20 years old yet, is positively unfreaking real from bell to bell. I can't stand him. Oh. I cannot stand him any other time, but from bell to bell, this kid is unbelievable. Man, now we just got a fist fight. The wrestling's gone out the window. And it's been a great athletic match so far. Jackknife Cradle. No, nope. Trevor caught him, Sunset. No, did not get it. Fish out of water here. Roy trying to get on top, too. No. He had the weight on him. That's what you got to do in that situation. Backslide. Oh. Only two. Man, Charles kind of a little fast on that, if you ask me. Roy knows Trevor Lee's moves, but he looks a little lost. Cover, no, two, woo, only. Almost with the O'Connor roll there. I thought that was going to be it. He looks a little lost in between. Ah, the Walter Eaton double stomp. The plan B. A tip of the hat to perhaps his former tag team partner? We don't know. But hey, if it works, it works. Undeniably so. Wilkins has clearly benefited from the teachings of the All-Stars. Cover, one, two, only two. Man. And these two, I know we heard the five-minute call not long ago. We might be running out of time here pretty soon. Roy just trying to make a big punch. It looks like he may be getting frustrated here, Cecil. Well, he's unloaded almost everything he has. He's hit the big golf swing. He's, he's hit the Canadian Destroyer, which is not legal in CWF Mid-Atlantic. He slid it by referee Charles Richardson. Almost got disqualified there. I think maybe he thought it was worth the risk. Man, if he doesn't open up those fists, he might get disqualified. Roy off the ropes again. Uh, oh, God! Chet held his foot. Orange Crush? Oh, oh, my God! He connected with it! Man! And Trevor Lee wins it with the assist of Chet Sterling. Yeah, Chet grabbed that foot. Trevor was able to catch the knee, followed up by the Orange Crush right into the pin. Unbelievable from both guys. Trevor Lee wins it. Your Weaver Cup champion, Trevor Lee. But an excellent showing by Roy Wilkins nonetheless. Really great matchup, but in the end, the, the, what made the difference was Chet Sterling on the outside for all Roy Wilkins' efforts. Going it alone proves to be a mistake here at Wild Things.
As promised, the world's most infamous. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your CWF Minute Leg Tag Team Champions, the Dynasty, the first Quick Converse, and X Cyrus. The theme song to the Sopranos. Piano. Got a strange way of seeing life like you see me wonder with beads under the do rag Intuition is fair, even when my vision's impaired. Yeah, knowing I can go, just switching the spin on the highway of life, bitch, chopping my side. Keen senses ever since I was a teen on the benches. Every time somebody like Enos is mentioned, I will turn green, green, green in the trenches. Living adventurous, not worrying about expenditures. things Cecil Scott and Brad Stutz in the booth Cecil how many times do you see a tag team title match featuring four former mid-atlantic champions and four of the most decorated wrestlers in mid-atlantic history this one is in every sense of the word a main event oh this is the very very definition of a main event almost a dream match situation you know, four, probably the four most successful wrestlers ever in CWF Mid-Atlantic. It very well could be Xyrus with the go-behind on Valiant. Xyrus, a former CWF Rumble winner, multiple-time tag team champion, former television champion, former Ultra J champion. And he defeated Lee Valiant back about two years ago to capture the Mid-Atlantic heavyweight championship. Valiant, a former heavyweight champion and television champion. Another former Rumble winner and almost a Weaver Cup champion this year. Right, and probably, you know, that that's not a subject I would bring up to Lee Valiant myself. Uh, probably the most soul-crushing loss of his entire career. But it has yielded benefits, an incredible emotional main event that we saw here three weeks ago, and both men getting rewarded for that. Trevor Lee had the chance to pick his own opponent, declined it. Lee Valiant was awarded a tag team title opportunity. Of course, the prize for winning the Weaver Cup is a guaranteed heavyweight title shot, as we talked about. Valiant, such an incredible effort three weeks ago, sort of a consolation prize, so to speak, a shot at the tag team championship. It's a heck of a consolation. You know, tag title is nothing to sneeze at. It's a main event title here. Absolutely so. And you know, let's go ahead and mention Kazi and Lee Valiant. This is not the first time they've attempted to team together. No, it is not. They were partners. We thought it a one-time only affair back at the 350th show. And a lot of us thought that we would never see that tag team materialize. Coach Jim and I actually very sarcastically offered them a tag team title shot earlier this year after the 350th card. And, uh, you know, we saw how it, basically Coach knew that these guys were never going to get along and was proven right as the Goon Squad retained the tag belt. So this is an interesting uh, situation here that Valiant could have picked, you know, just about anybody as his partner and elected to go with Kazi. You know, maybe these guys have made amends. Maybe the relationship is better than we thought. Hey, you know what they say, time heals all wounds. So we'll see. There were a lot of wounds between those two. I don't mind telling you. To say the least. But they have a common goal here. They, they're focused. They want the tag team titles. Kazi trying to get things back on track. Had a bit of a rough summer. 
I thought he picked up a huge win over the Mecha Mercenary back three weeks ago on finals night. Yes, so yes, while it while it was a rough summer, Ooh. oh God, he, he could, he's back on the winning streak as of three weeks ago, and that could continue tonight. Converse oh. slaps Kazi down. And these two obviously no strangers. It was a few years ago they had maybe the most violent match I have ever seen in CWF Mid-Atlantic. Of course, the Kazi rules match, light tubes, chairs, chains, and pretty much everything else under the sun was used. There was a noose in that match. Kazi got hanged. Take down from Kazi, and we talked about the credentials of all four men. Kazi, a former Weaver Cup champion, a former Mid-Atlantic tag team champion, a former Ultra J champion himself. Just pretty much every accolade that you can win, these four guys have just about all won it. I, I think you're right. I think these are the four most decorated wrestlers in CWF Mid-Atlantic history. Oh. oh, God. Kick to Converse. And, of course, the one man whose credentials we have not touched on yet, Rick Converse, six-time Mid-Atlantic champion, former Rumble winner, former Weaver Cup tournament winner. This is actually Converse's very first tag team team title reign. And it's been a very uh, fruitful reign thus far. I mean, it's gone on several months at this point. Absolutely. Defeated Richards and Jason Miller. Defeated Lewis Moore and Matt Houston, the Mid-Atlantic Outlaws. A couple of successful title defenses under the uh, the belt of the dynasty. Also defeated the Aftermath, yep. who were their rivals for months and months and months. Defense number four here are the Tag Team Championship from and the it, Dynasty. And Nick Cyrus has been here for most of them. Absolutely. The importance of the Tag Team titles cannot be understated here. CWF Mid-Atlantic is positively one of the few remaining wrestling organizations that absolutely positively values Tag Team Wrestling. Oh, I love Tag Team Wrestling. I've been in the Tag Team almost my whole tenure here. You know, it's, it's, it takes a different skill set to be a successful tag team. And how many times are you going to see a major event it, from one of the big boys headlined by a tag team title match? It virtually never happens, but we are here at Wild Things with the tag team championship on the line in the main event of the night. And thus far, very even, you know, ground-based wrestling match. You know, it's a lot of respect in this ring. You know, they've all done battle with each other at some point, so there's a, so much familiarity, so much respect. You really could say it's almost the four cornerstones of CWF Mid-Atlantic here in this tag team match. I, I would not argue with that for a second. At the very least, four of the main cornerstones. Crowd here a little bit uh, a little bit uneasy in their reactions here tonight. All four of these guys pretty much universally beloved. Crowd doesn't really have anyone that they dislike, but I really think that that almost superhuman an effort that we saw from Lee Valiant on finals night wrestling over an hour total between the two matches. I really think the crowd here really wants to see Lee Valiant get some redemption here on his path back to the top. Right. They, they, they know how heartbreaking that loss was to him, and they really want to see him regroup and get things back together. Valiant drops an elbow, staying on Converse. Of course, these two men had one of the most historic matches in CWF history, the 60-minute Ironman match, the longest match in CWF history. Went over 60 minutes where Lee Valiant defeated Converse in an incredible Ironman matchup. Oh. Look at Kazi fly. And it may stand the test of time. You know, many people consider it the greatest match in company history. Snapmare. Woo! Good God, that hurts! And I've been on the bad end of that many times. Converse is down, looking hurt. You can see the pain on his face. We talked about recklessness earlier tonight with Lance Lude and Nick Richards. Is there anyone in CWF history that has historically been as reckless, even with his own body, as the Kamikaze Kid? He definitely lives up to his name more than anybody else. Converse, kitchen sinks him right in the gut. Second big knee right in the gut in the sternum. Side Russian, yes it is. Great combo of moves there. One thing that I think we're really going to see in this one is these guys have all wrestled each other so many times. I think we're going to see a situation sort of like what we saw develop in the last match where these guys all know each other's moves so well. And yeah, maybe even more so than we saw in the last match. And we saw a point right there. Like Cyrus being pretty much uh, taken out of the equation immediately by Kazi. Oh, God. Oh. Kazi snaps the neck. That's violent. Oh, puts two knees in the back. 
Exiris down on the canvas and hurting. Referee Red Jones might be checking for a pulse cover. And Kazi's honestly looking great in there. It seems like neither Converse nor Exiris, well, I spoke too soon, have been able to get one up on him. X just drills him. He realized he's got to get him out of that corner, though. You saw that moment of hesitation cover. You saw that moment of hesitation from Exiris, and I really believe, I think that was the moment that he realized, holy crap, Kazi's almost in his corner. Yeah, and that was a case of, you know, two guys who aren't used to teaming together didn't know where the other guy was. Great they, point. There was a, probably a moment where either guy could have made the tag, and they just kept missing each other. No, that's a great point. Converse is back in. Oh, God, we see there's still some bad blood between Converse and Valiant after all these years. Nice Huge bull. Bulldog, and now he's going to make the tag. Lee Valiant is legal. And we're going to see how well Valiant keeps his temper in check. You know there's got to be some, some anger stewing underneath from after Weaver Cup finals night. I think you're right. I think that could be one of the big stories of this matchup is Lee Valiant's temper. We know him as a hothead. We know him as someone who just gets so overcome with emotion sometimes it pours out of him like an open wound. And he's been incredibly distant the last three weeks. I mean, you're, you guys are good buddies, and I know he hasn't kept in contact with, with a whole lot of people since then. I've seen him one time in three weeks, and that was this afternoon. We actually rode to the town together, and uh, you're right. He was distant. He was not. Uh, usually we're talking, we're joking, we're, we're quoting movies, whatever. He was distant. He was definitely taking tonight very, very seriously. And I'd say, you know, team, you know, aside from a couple of moments, Kazi and Lee Valiant have really, I'd say, taken a good 75% of this match so far. I agree. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like they've they've really found their groove here, and that could be the case. Great move from Kazi. Suplex cover. Exiris had to save the matchup. Kazi and Lee, it really does seem like they have found their groove. They found their niche. And I, there's not been a ton of teamwork between the two, but it's not really come into play. You know, they individually, they've done a good job of separating uh, Rick Converse here. Come on, Rick. Could be that elbow drop. No, it's the leg drop. On, Valiant makes the cover. Yeah, Could nice. have been a three count right there. Yeah, yeah nice yeah. cover there. I'm, you know, wouldn't have been surprised if he got in there. I think it's going to take something big. You know, these guys all know each other so well. Literally, all four of these guys, every combination that you can think of, all four of these guys have literally wrestled each other over a dozen times for years and years here in CWF Mid-Atlantic and, and other regional promotions all over the Mid-Atlantic. These guys have all wrestled each other over a dozen times. So the familiarity is there. You know, I think it's going to need to be something big. But at the same time, everybody's going to have everybody's big move scouted. But so maybe it's going to be the element of surprise. I don't know. But I, I got to believe that, that it's not going to be a rudimentary something that wins this matchup. No, especially the caliber of, of wrestlers that we have in there in this match. It's going to take a lot. You know, you speak of the familiarity. I mean, if I my memory serves, one of Kazi's very first matches here was with Rick Converse many, many years ago. His CWF debut was back in 2002. Kazi going to go for the Hurricane Rana here? No. Converse. Oh, my. Oh, God. Sky high off the ropes. Good grief. And I'm pretty sure Kazi almost died in that first match just like he almost died right there. Took all the air out of Kazi. And the crowd here really wants to see the titles change. They really want to see Kazi and Valiant as the tag team champions. Interesting scenario that is unfolding here. Do you think with the, the crowd kind of swaying the other way, do you think there's a possibility the Dynasty are going to be back up to their old tricks here? I and mean, if you do what you got to do to hold on to the tag team titles, I mean, if you have to take a shortcut here and there, you do it. Exiris, big calf kick, great move, great precision, caught Valiant right in the face. X limping a little bit could have gotten hurt on something in this matchup. Hey, he might have caught something, you know, doing that leg lariat. Yeah, it's hard to say. And with the crowd back to the crowd really doesn't know what to make of this. It's like they like everybody so much they don't want to cheer for anybody. <laughs> well, no, you, you get a lot of people that are talking to Kazi and Lee and, 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 and really calling for them to make tags and calling for them to potentially win the titles. I think it's taken some of the air out of the building here that Converse and Exiris now are in control. Undeniably, oh, great power bomb. Undeniably, the building was louder when Kazi and Lee were in control. Cover, only two. Well, title change, you know, fans always want to see a title change, especially when it's, 
you know, kind of an underdog team, if you're honest about it. Absolutely. You know, these guys absolutely positively hated each other for years. And for Valiant to now pick him oh. as a partner is a, a, a crazy scenario. And Xyrus using the rope for leverage. We just speculated on if the Dynasty might be back up to the old tricks when they were called the Aftermath. And it looks like Xyrus, uh, like you said, is throwing whatever out the window to retain those championship belts. You know, it's not, no, not a big thing grabbing the rope, but those tricks are always in the back of your mind, no matter, no matter how the fans really feel about you. So in other words, you feel like it is a struggle not to, you know, grab the rope or, or something once you once you are hearing the cheers of the fans and maybe once you decide that, you know, that it, uh, that's advantageous to your game and you don't want to let the fans down, you're saying it's a constant struggle to not bend or break the rules. I really feel like it is because so many times, how many times do you see somebody like a Trevor Lee or a Chet Sterling bend the rules? And he, you know, it has to be hard not to fight fire with fire. It's a great point. Converse working on Valiant here. You know, you see the ropes or you see a man's eyes are wide open where you can poke him. Valiant creating some space here. No, Converse decks him. Dynasty has absolutely become the aggressors in this situation. You know, this might be their chance. Uh, Lee Valiant and, Kazi, and Kamikaze Kid have taken a lot of this match, and I think they finally cut off Lee Valiant. Look at the look on Xyrus's face. And we saw Kazi kind of do that move earlier, throw it in the face of Xyrus. It's one of his patented moves. A lot of bad blood between Kazi and Xyrus. And yeah, these two go back years and years as well. They've been sometimes partners, you know, mm. many times enemies. Kazi and Lee, uh, excuse me, Kazi and Xyrus were former tag team champions years ago. One of my very first matches was against these two as a team, believe it or not. There may be no matchup in CWF history that has been seen as many times as Kazi versus X in any various scenario. Like you said, partners, opponents, six mans, cyberneticos, eight mans, ten mans, fourteen mans. These guys have been through everything. You know, all over Carolinas, all over Virginia. Of course, Valiant and Xyrus have a lot of history. They've wrestled as far as California and Nevada. Oh. Great neck breaker from Xyrus. These guys have wrestled all the way to the West Coast against each other. Man, nice neck breaker there. I like the combination of moves. Gets Converse back in, and Converse is going to slow it down again and put his weight on top of Valiant. Dynasty undeniably risen to become the aggressors. They want to hold on to these titles, Cecil. Right, and they're doing, you know, they're not taking a whole lot of big shortcuts, but they are using a lot of little tricks, you know, being smart. And I think right now putting on a hold like a camel clutch is an incredibly smart move. Oh boy, Valiant trying to get up, trying to get out of this hold. Converse is trapped here. Boom! All of his weight on the Rick Converse's midsection. And both of these guys, I think, would be very well served to tag, especially Lee Valiant. We should point out, as we have pointed out all summer long, it is hot in this building. Right, even as it cools down outside, it's very hot in here. As, as this match goes past the 15-minute mark and into the 20-minute mark, I think you're going to see uh, fatigue set in, especially if they can keep one man pretty much locked in the ring like they have so far with Valiant. And I think isolated Lee Valiant might be the smart choice. He's kind of an emotional roller coaster right now. You know, physically speaking, he's in great shape, but emotionally, I still wonder where his head's at. Talking about Valiant being the hot head, Xyrus has always been the hot head of the dynasty, and he puts a little oomph on that reverse suplex, drops Valiant down to the canvas. And now he's just kind of toying with him. You're seeing a little bit of the old aftermath, uh, Xyrus, right there. Don't cause it to stay back. Oh! Just held him open and stomped him. Oh, sweet oh. shot from Kazi, not the legal man, but he takes a page out of Lee Valiant's book, that slingshot spear to help his partner. Yeah, I think he'd had enough of the trash talk. Whoa. German. Big German, drop Converse on his head here. But Valiant is still legal, he's still got to make the tag at some point. 
Kaiser might be doing him more harm than good right now. He needs to let Lee Valiant make the tag. Well, Red Jones, it looks like he's going to let him go. We could have a disqualification here as all four men have filed into the ring. They send the dynasty into each other. Double in Zaguri. Xyrus is the legal man technically with Valiant. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, what in the world? They're scaling opposite sides of the ropes. This is going to be an image of the year right here. Elbow oh. and the frog splash connects. Double pin. No. Two. Red Jones says two. And they need to stay on him here. Lee Valiant, Cyrus is still the legal man. I'm not sure it matters now with Red Jones. He might have lost track. Both members of the dynasty are down. Kazi and Lee are going to try to put something to double slice bread. Wow, these two are working together way better than I ever expected. Oh, DUI! Dynasty will retain the titles right here! That's it! That is it! One, two, oh. two! Only a count of two! You don't see people kick out of the DUI very often. Exiris visibly frustrated. And Exiris, you know, much more likely to lose this cool than Rick Converse, and we're going to see what happens here. Still favoring that leg, too. Exiris could be going for the Swanton Bomb here. It's a big man up there. Oh, that hurts so bad when you miss it. Kazi strikes Converse. And they got a chance here to really, you know, double up on Xyrus and go ahead and put this away. X has got to be hurting in the center of the ring at this point. Might see a Death Valley driver. Yes, it is. One of Kazi's patented moves. No, X has got it scouted so well he uses the ropes to his advantage and avoids it. Now Xyrus right back on top. Uses the ropes to his advantage. Uh-oh. Converse is up. Richter scale. This will be all. Drills oh. him with it. Ten minutes remain. That's going to be it. Two. Oh. No. Kazi kicks it two. He took that right in the ribs, too. And now some fans are getting on the case of referee Red Jones wanting the dynasty to retain. Converse is visibly confused. That Richter scale has been a fight stopper literally for almost a decade now. He's won a lot of titles with the, with the Richter scale, but Lee Valiant pulling him out of the ring. It's become a, a war of self-preservation for both teams now. Here as we have passed the 20-minute mark. Now we're looking it out. This thing's turning into a fist fight. Hey, wait, you're not supposed to do anything down the ring. Suplex? Yeah. No. Dang it, I'm not going to let him have it. Yeah. Oh, oh, God, dropped him against the ropes. Kazi sends Converse all the way to the floor. He crashes hard. And that might have been a little short-sighted because you want him in the oh, ring. Man. Oh, boy. Kazi is going to put that recklessness to use right here. Oh. The bad blood between Kazi and Converse that has gone on for years and years <laughs> continues, but somebody has got to get somebody in a position to win the match here. Guys are letting their emotions get the best of them, Cecil, and no one is trying to win these tag team titles. Yeah, you're not going to win a title diving out of the ring. Hey, Rick, go home. He needs to watch out for Xyrus. Yeah, he does. It's the ropes. Oh, boy. Oh, very Caught smart. Him. Oh, great God. move from Exyrus. Valiant anticipated it, but got caught with the crossbody attempt. Everyone is down. Tag team titles hang in the balance here at Wild Things. Cover. Two, three. No, oh. no, no. Two, two, two. And now I have to wonder what else can they pull out of the out of the arsenal to get this done. All four guys giving it their all here. And these two in a very precarious situation up here on the apron. Oh, boy. Uh, no. Got nothing. Big oh. DDT and they're both down. And that we've spoken about this before. That is absolutely the hardest part of the ring. It's nothing but frame, metal, and wood on that apron. And we're down to Levi and an Xyrus. Tag team title in the balance. Calling for the double underhook impaler once again. No. 
Sends him into the ropes, does Valiant. Valiant is winded, he needs to capitalize on it. These guys have been beating the crap out of each other for upwards of 20 minutes now. Slice bread, no! Every move is scouted to precision. And now what he means he's gonna go for a suplex? Is he gonna, gonna hang him there? What is looks like it looks like it's gonna be a belly to back suplex from Xyrus. Kazi coming up from behind. Slugging away. Oh boy. Oh my god! Oh god! Oh god! Oh god. Slice bread and a power bomb! And they won the titles! We've got new tag team champions! Unbelievable new tag team champions here at Wild Thing. I have to say, I did not see that coming. 23 seconds, 21. Oh. 23 minutes, 21 seconds. We got a brand new finisher match. Let's go. 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 Let's go